people are sitting outside, you know, having conversations with friends and loved ones and enjoying that meal. And, and it starts a ripple effect from there, both inside, then outside the, the eatery and the brewery. And I just don't want it lost on them that what they're doing is important. Welcome to The Profitable Table, fed by Woolco Foods, the nation's first podcast devoted to the business and lifestyle of the hospitality industry. Now, here's your host, Woolco Foods CEO, Stephen Toberoff. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Profitable Table, fed by Woolco Foods. I am your host, Stephen Toberoff, and I am very much excited for this interview today, for a lot of different reasons that I think will unfold as the conversation proceeds. But it's really fortuitous that my guest was willing to make some time to speak with me and, you know, very much, very much interested in exploring a number of issues. So let's just jump right into it. My guest is Jeff Tucker, who is the founder and owner of Teddy's Brew House in Brownwood, Texas. Is that right? Yes, sir. Brownwood, Texas. Brownwood, Texas. Now, Jeff, You came to my attention because I was a guest on a podcast called The Cowboy Perspective, hosted by Neil Dudley. And after I I did that podcast, I listened to a few of his older episodes, and I came across his interview with you. And it was a great interview, and I was really interested by so much of your story and what you're into and a number of common interests that I think we have that I reached out to you to do this interview Uh, because it dovetails nicely with what we're about on this podcast. So before we go deeper into some subjects, would you mind just telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved with Teddy's Brewhouse? Yeah, sure. My original career path was that of a a firefighter in Fort Worth, Texas. Spent 20 years there and 10 years as a, in operations and then 10 years as an arson bomb investigator. And then I retired out of that uh, career in 2001. Uh, about three weeks before 9-11, and then started going off into other ventures there in the Fort Worth, Dallas area, construction, things of that nature. Had several other businesses I'd kind of developed there. Had a background in the food industry as a younger man. Worked my way from dishwasher to assistant manager as a pizza joint, you know, and then opened up a couple of other restaurant slash sports bar type facilities. And, uh, you know, long story short, getting to where I am today, we had retired to this community on a ranch north of town, uh, Brownwood, and I kept looking at at vacant properties there. Just for me, I was seeing opportunity. And so we bought a historic building in downtown Brownwood. It's 140 years old, and it was the um, kind of like the original Home Depot of its time, built in 1888 called the Weekly Watson Hardware and Gun Store. And it had been in business from that time until 2014. And when it came on the market, we just thought it'd be great to kind of purchase the property and and preserve it as a historic preservation. And so we took the building and turned it into a, it's on National Park Services marker as a historic site and also under the Texas Historic Commission. And we turned it into a brew house and eatery. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. And um, I was on your website today, which is teddysbrewhouse.com. And the images look incredible. So much of your story I can relate to because our customers are here in New York City and Jersey City and the areas around that and the state of New Jersey. But in New York City, so many buildings are landmarked. And on the one hand, it presents an enormous opportunity. On the other hand, it presents an enormous challenge. Just for reference for our audience that's out here in New York, was the community or the or the entities responsible for designating landmarks and preserving them supportive of your endeavor? Or did you find that it was perhaps a, a, a larger challenge than you might have anticipated? I think that's kind of the, you know, the constant I would always hear is don't ever do a historic renovation it's an absolute pain to deal with. And for us, it was a grand experience. One of my degrees in college was history, so I'm very passionate about that. And so we saw it as an opportunity to try to give back to the town from a standpoint of, of preserving a historic site. I mean, this this particular locale, the Weekly Watson building, 
is known as the oldest gun store in Texas. It dates back to 1876. And then they moved across the street to this particular site in 1904. But even in 1888, when this place was constructed, it was one of two hardware stores in the area, and it was the gateway to the West. People stopped by there on their way to California. So it was certainly worth preserving. And as far as the entities themselves, National Park Services, Secretary of State Interior, and the Texas Historic Commission had very specific rules. And I think if you can read, <laughs> you know, you shouldn't run into any problems really kind of dealing with these types of sites. I was a self-appointed general contractor for this development. And we probably only ran into one conversation that I would consider somewhat tedious with Texas Historic Commission. And it was just on a particular finish of a particular wall in a particular room. But other than that, it was a pretty grand experience. As long as you can follow the suggestions made by the historic renovation, they all seem to make sense. You know, there's certain things that have to be upgraded. There's certain things that have historic relief meaning that they would still qualify for a 2015 building code, but under the old guise of original intent of usage of the building. But every building, I think, is going to obviously create its own problems, too. So now that's you know, this true. is my first historic renovation. Yeah. Hmm. We just recently purchased a hotel across the street that was uh, completed in 1930 called the Brownwood Hotel. And I'm sure it's going to present us with some very specific <laughs> conundrums as we you know, dive into that historic preservation. But yeah, I mean, we had a good experience. And I think if you take the right approach, you certainly want to make sure that you're going to follow the requirement. But just because you follow the requirement doesn't mean that there aren't conversations that can be had with these entities who preserve such buildings and get some wiggle room when you need it. We certainly did. That's really Quite fascinating and helpful because a number of our customers, as I say, the majority are actually in New York City, and we have a lot of listeners that are entrepreneurs or people who aspire to open up their own hospitality business one day, restaurant, bar, what have you. And I think it's really interesting to hear your experience because I think the challenges that some of those in New York City face when dealing with historical landmarks is more of the local communities. But I think it's uh -huh. also quite inspiring and encouraging that uh, people shouldn't be dissuaded from it. And if you have the right approach, it can be terrific. I want to get into your background in history very much because history is one of my passions as well. But I want to stay on the restaurant itself for a bit and my, my follow-up on that is one of the things that was very interesting, both in the interview that you had on the cowboy perspective, but even looking at your website and doing some research, is you have a phenomenal menu, very interesting menu, but also a real emphasis, I think it would be fair to say, at least that's the impression I get, on the craft brewery that you have there. Sure. Because this is, this is also something that comes up a lot for people that want to have a craft brewery but have a restaurant. How do you balance the emphasis within your business? You know, obviously you're doing your own brew. I see that a lot of the, the bottles are your brand, your bottles. How do you balance that with selecting the type of beer you want to offer, dealing with that craft brewery nature of it, while at the same time having the food that's going to not only pair well with it, but perhaps be a cause for people to come to your business as well? How do you balance those two priorities? Yeah, it's a fair question. And we take, a, I think, a unique approach in the world of so-called craft beer. When you try to define what that means, certainly region and locale and and expertise will help define what somebody thinks a craft brewery is, uh, both in size or, you know, content of the physical brews themselves. Wes and I, I'll be very frank with you, I am not the brewmaster, nor does anybody want me to be. Uh, you know, I'm learning how to create craft beer, whereas our brewmaster and our business partner in this, Wes Kearney, these are recipes that he both had and that we altered together because we wanted to seek out about six or seven solid base craft beers that we enjoy. And so we really are presenting something that we just like to drink and enjoy. I then to the craft breweries where, you know, Hey, I got this one exotic craft beer, but I'll be damned if I can choke down another one. And the mouthfeel is too strong or the impact on the palate is too much. And so you find yourself sipping on one pint. Well, our business model is to try to create multiple purchases, both within the place as 
you know, for beer, if you came in to have a libation and wine or for meal or both. So we want you to be able to enjoy a couple of beers. Our average sales are, you know, somewhere between two and a half to three and a half beers per patron is what we see. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that if they come in to get a good German Kolsch, they're going to enjoy it and they're going to order another one. And if they're having a meal that's got some, maybe some high spice or sodium content, they're going to wash it down with, with an additional beer. So they kind of marry together really well. But we really just wanted to take the approach of making six or seven solid base beers that people would just enjoy. And then we're also in an area that we've had to teach a small town of 20,000 how to develop a palate and not be afraid of craft beer. That's another thing that we run into constantly is a lack of information that just because it says craft microbrewery doesn't mean that you're not going to get something you enjoy. In this area of Texas, which is right smack dab in the middle of Texas, centrally located, we're surrounded by a lot of ranches. Uh, Our closest large cosmopolitan area would be Abilene, which is about an hour drive away. Dallas, Fort Worth, about two and a half hours. Austin, about two and a half hours which are some of our larger complexes, but we have people driving in strictly to try a new brewery that's on, you know, the whiskey, beer, and wine trail in Texas, and which we happen to be on too, uh, strategically. So all of these things kind of marry well together in success of letting people sample and taste and find what they like and tell us what they don't like. We create a, a stout, oatmeal stout there, very similar to the Guinness profile, but use the debittered malt so that the last finish of the beer is still really, really good. And you're not getting that bitter aftertaste like you would stay in a, a Guinness. So we look at our, our recipes several different ways, what works, what doesn't. And we'll create a couple of extra beers on tap as seasonals. We just completed a triple Belgium that we're about to put out. We've got another one called Igben, which is our Oktoberfest. But people love it so much, we've just kept it on the tap year round. So those are kind of some of the approaches we've taken. And then with the food, that's another thing. We have a rotating nightly feature. Our staples are oven fresh pizzas and and pretzels and salads, but we only have one entree served that night. So if I decide that day we're cooking ribs or brisket or lobster tails, that's what we're doing. And we gauge it based off what we think our plates will be that night. And we make one main feature. And that's been another thing that's been unique to Teddy's from a standpoint of this area. They're not really quite used to that. Most people are used to seeing 10 to 15 to 30 things on a, on a menu item. And we didn't want to take that approach for, for a variety of reasons. That's such a valuable answer that is so full of information for people that are, are just getting started and even established professionals. I mean, from the beginning, I was listening very closely. You're talking about delegation. You find the right person yep. for the right job. You don't have to micromanage. That's the success of the of the of the owner. In this case, he's your partner. But the other thing that you're talking about, which is so important, and I know exactly what you're talking about. Like I remember many, many years ago I went to this place called the Vermont Pub and Brew in Burlington, and the beer was phenomenal. And it had a great reputation. And I'm sure there's a lot of people in there that were super knowledgeable about craft beer, which I was not. I just found it to be incredibly delicious, refreshing, and we're going back 20 years. I think a lot of Mm -hmm. times when people take on, whether it's a certain type of brewery or a certain type of cuisine, they sometimes think they need to overcomplicate things or really demonstrate their bona fides as exotic. And in reality, you want to be first and foremost focused on the customers and that they have a great experience. And then those aspects of uniqueness or traditional brewery or, or whatever it is, have to ultimately conclude in a positive customer experience that generates revenue, repeat customers, and referrals. Absolutely. Sometimes people lose sight of that. No doubt. And and it's a keep it simple, stupid approach from our perspective. And it truly is less is more. And we deliver, you know, on a given night for a space our size and in the area that we're in, we recently had a night where I think we delivered over 175 plates in about a two and a half hour span, which is our busiest peak time, that's less than a plate a minute. <laughs> and, and it, we did it well or did it to the best of our ability. I mean, that night I'll probably give us an A minus. And just because not everyone is completely happy, I don't think no matter how good you do, but we do try to focus on the fact that we get it out right. We can get it out quickly. It's done well. We pick our proteins to be specific in that we can prep and plate rather quickly. 
we do a prime rib night, you know, we've already cooked all the prime ribs. We know about how many we're going to get for loin. And, and then we just start cutting away and going as the night progresses. And, you know, and the other thing too, is when we run out, well, we run out, you should have got there earlier. So we try real hard to cover all of our, our bases, but, you know, doing the way we do it, it's got pros and it's got some cons as well, but it works for our model. I think really, really well. You know, it's interesting because I, I actually have found throughout my years of doing this that it's a, it's not always, look, obviously it's not good for the customer because they're disappointed. It's not necessarily good, necessarily good from a business standpoint when you run out because you, you could be leaving revenue on the table. But I've found that it's actually a sign of a restaurant that's really committed to quality and excellence. And that ties into longevity because if you're really focused on having the right amount of food, that it's fresh, that it's going to be prepared the way you want it, and you're just overwhelmed by demand, yes, it's disappointing, but it's far better, I think, over the long term to be in that position than putting out stuff that's mediocre just to have it. I, I just don't think it leads to the same long-term outcome. I com you know? completely agree with you, completely agree with you. And I've seen and I've seen it many, many times throughout the years. I mean, and also scarcity is something that really brings customers back as well. And it's very clear to me, and I, I, I your website communicates this as well. Every aspect of of Teddy's, it's communicated to me, really high quality, but a lot of thought goes into it. I love your merchandise. I love the T-shirts. Very cool. You know, some people do merch as just a throw on, but your stuff is really really cool and, and really well designed. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Now, staying with Teddy's, but segueing into another aspect of what I want to discuss with you, Teddy's Brew House is named correct after Theodore Roosevelt, right? That is, that is correct. And I've read many books on Theodore Roosevelt, and probably not as many as you, so I'm interested to learn some new stuff. But my first question, <laughs> though, is why... Name the restaurant after Theodore Roosevelt. What was the reasoning for yeah. involving him? And, and it's a question we get constantly, and it's a good, you know, it's a good conversation piece too. Walking into the building, you know, most people walk up and say, "Hey, are you Teddy?" Thinking that an owner named Teddy has started this thing, and it, it creates a good laugh and a, and a good warm conversation. But the main reason is, I've got a couple of degrees from uh, Texas Christian University out of Fort Worth, and one's philosophy and the other is history, and I. I just recently wrapped up my master's in history. I don't know that I'll ever use it other than just for my own reward, but I studied a lot of uh, Theodore Roosevelt's past in earning that degree. And it fits the timeline during the 1880s of the building. He had come to Texas quite a bit, hunted on some area ranches not too far from us, had traveled to Fort Worth and San Antonio. And of course, before going over to Cuba, with the Rough Riders, assembled them there at the Minger Hotel and outside of San Antonio as his base before loading up and heading to Cuba. So he's just an iconic figure. He's he's a great flawed figure. You know, there's nothing about him perfect, but he is the iconic bootstrap, self-willed, hard life type of individual, uh, the strenuous life, if you will, as he said. And, and so he just seemed to fit the building. You know, we wanted to decorate it into something, too, that would pay an homage to that type of mindset. And it also, that's what the building and the businesses were that were in Brownwood at that time. They they didn't have large banks backing them. They, they really bootstrapped their way through surviving and growing a community. And so there's a lot of reasons that, that really come to it. I wish I could give you one. No, 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 that's yeah. uh, that's perfect. I mean, you know, it's a cliche, but in my case, it's true. When I read the book, The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt by Edmund Morris, <laughs> and it was probably when I was 32 years old, that book really did change my life. I went on to read the other two. It's If you're looking for a great book to read, start with The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt. Even if you know nothing about him, you will be blown away by what this man did. And and one of the things that you were saying, Jeff, where he pulled himself up by his bootstraps, which is true, what I got out of that book and what I incorporated into my life, you know, like after reading that book, I, I decided I'm going to run the New York City Marathon. I'd always run, but I did that. That book inspired me to push myself beyond what I was normally doing because Theodore Roosevelt not only 
pulled himself up by his bootstraps. He made decisions to deliberately make his life challenging. He didn't have sure. to. He was born in wealth and all of that other stuff. And I think it's sure. so cool that you pay homage and that the restaurant ties in with him. It's absolutely perfect. I could talk about Theodore Roosevelt forever, but the fact that you, <laughs> you have a history degree leads me to my next question. And I think about this sure. a lot as a business person because I love to read and I mostly read history. I have a degree in, in English language and literature from University of Chicago. I was reading mostly fiction. Then I went on to get a law degree. But right about the time I got to be 26, I would say 90 to 95 percent of the books I read are history. And what mm -hmm. I have found, and I'd love to know your thoughts on this, what I have found is that reading history, whether it's biography or military history or strategic aspects of history, has been so, so valuable to me as a business person. Even you're not directly learning things about business, quote unquote, and there are some great business books, but there's something super valuable about having a relationship with a Theodore Roosevelt, a Winston Churchill, a George Washington, a Jackie Robinson, whatever historical figures you develop a relationship with through reading, you can tap into that relationship when you're facing adversity or a challenge or you want to take on something big. Would you agree with that? Or what are your thoughts in terms of how your studies of history have benefited you as a business person? I think the easiest way to answer that is you are what you eat. And so you are what you read as well. To me, being able to dive into scholarship and academia, whether it's the meditations by Marcus Aurelius or Teddy Roosevelt writing about the Navy and the redevelopment of the Navy after 1812, you certainly can tap into that, and especially if you're open to really understanding the author. The older I get, the more not only do I read history, but I want to find out who wrote that history and their background as well, because you want to see what they're bringing into that interpretation. What I like about characters like Roosevelt, or Roosevelt rather, Teddy, when you read what he wrote, you'd certainly tap more into the man or what he wanted to be perceived as, as, as a figure. And I think he knew he certainly was a man of his times and that he was doing things that were unprecedented. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And so it certainly has given me an indirect reward to be unencumbered and unafraid to take steps forward, even in this model and this venture that we're doing. Most of the people in the town didn't really quite, it wasn't that they weren't supportive of it, they didn't understand it. And they'd never had had a brewery in this area, unless you go back to the mid-1800s where they had saloons, you know, and uh, and even then it was very limited. So it, it was really, you know, for me, I, I tend to become what I read in some respect and certainly lean on it when making decisions. But it gives you different perspectives and different views of the world and different time and era perspectives as well. And it doesn't mean that they can't still be applicable, you know, in 2021, because they are. But no, I think you definitely become what you read. I, I wish I could remember right now, my synapses aren't firing well enough to remember that the author who said you become what you read, I think is how the phrase went. I just can't remember the author. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I'm, I so often rely upon lessons that I've learned through reading about history. And it's so, um, in my opinion, it's so sad that in New York, they're removing the statue of Theodore oh. Roosevelt in front of the Museum of Natural it's History. Uh, it's absolutely astonishing. When I, I recently saw where they have taken down a, a Thomas Jefferson as well. And I'm just like, look, you can't, you're never going to make amends by erasing history. That's my humble opinion. It doesn't that we can't, you know, we can certainly debate and philosophize over viewpoints about what these markers may mean. But when I saw Theodore Roosevelt's statue being removed, I'm like, it's just an absolute affront to, you know, the historical significance of this man. And for what reason, you know, to placate to somebody's feeling over a matter versus fact over a matter. It's pretty astonishing to me. And the way that you put it, feeling over fact, because most people have no idea that Theodore Roosevelt, and again, there's much to criticize about the man as there is yeah. about any man, and no one is perfect, and the purpose is to have a discussion. But I wonder how many of the people who are happy about this understand that Theodore Roosevelt was the first meaningful progressive 
in American political yeah. life. I wonder if they understand his square deal. I wonder if they understand the evolution that went on in his thinking towards the end of his life and how he wanted to change things. My guess is they don't. And if they did, they wouldn't do it. And that's another sort of warning sign that ignorance is not a good no. place to be. You should know what's going on before you do it. So I don't want to dwell on that. I will tell you that one of the, the, the hidden gems in New York City, to turn it into a positive, I assume it's still there, why wouldn't it be, is I had an opportunity to tour his boyhood home in Gramercy uh, Park. Anybody yeah. can do that. And it was great because it's the National Park Service that runs it. And I was literally the only person there at that time that day. I got a personal tour. And I can't recommend that book highly enough, The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt. If you want something a little more adventurous, The River oh, yeah. of Doubt by Candace Millard. Great book. But as you say, Jeff, the man was so prolific himself as a writer that, you know, you can read his own journals about his journey down the uh, Amazon or his his time as a rough writer. And the, the man had such an incredibly vibrant and packed life. But much sure. to learn there. And, uh, and much to learn from sure. a lot of things. Now, you just completed the the master's degree. So I have uh -huh. to ask you, you must be really terrific. Or I, I really respect that because you started this venture, as you told me. You're, you're taking on the venture of the hotel. You're getting a master's. You must be really phenomenal at time management or perhaps to even ask the question differently. Your approach to life, to me, is really cool because... A lot of people would limit themselves. I guess this is the Theodore Roosevelt, and you're doing all of these things. Some of them are quite disparate, and yet they must be incredibly enriching for your life. Well, it is, and my view of it is we have such a short time here. It's not necessarily about grandiose ideas of making impact so that others can lay praise at my feet. It's more of a, I just find things that I enjoy doing and seek them out, and and I'm passionate about specific things and want to see them to fruition. I've known a lot of people who focus on one thing and do it really well. And, you know, they find great fulfillment in that and, and, and kudos to them. I, I tend to take more of a shotgun approach to life and, you know, but I do get to experience a great many things because of that. Gosh, I've traveled the globe teaching a seminar for 12 years for CrossFit. I've gotten a couple of degrees and those have benefited me both in business and, in, in academia as well. And being a firefighter in Fort Worth, I, I had an abundance of time on my hands because of the type of shift work that we did. So I would always try to find myself busy versus idle. So yeah, I tend to, you know, I make my list and, and I try to pack everything I can into my list within the day and the month and the year, you know, all towards specific goals and others for just enjoyment. But I, I do take a different approach, I think, than, than maybe the norm. But you know what? I think your approach is, I don't want to say better or worse. It's not binary, but I, I found that people, particularly those that are in the hospitality industry that have a varied background, that have done a lot of different things, that in and of itself brings something intangible, but I think incredibly valuable to the restaurant, to the bar, to the bakery. Again, this is something I've seen with other people as well that have started out doing something different and then for whatever reason they open a restaurant or a bar. I find that people with varied backgrounds, and this wouldn't be you know difficult to understand, just create things that are, are very interesting and, and there's a certain sure. artistry to it. And I like that as well. I mean, I think you're right. There's so much to enjoy. I think there's another key point to that too is that everything I've tried to dabble into, I've, I've tried to find some tie where it's of service to somebody else. And when you're in the hospitality industry, you certainly are being of service. I mean, it, it, we hire a lot of young people at our facility and some their first time ever in a kitchen. And, you know, I try to impress upon them that think about what you did tonight. You, you produced a very good meal at a very good price point. People are sitting outside, you know, having conversations with friends and loved ones and enjoying that meal. And, and it starts a ripple effect from there, both inside, then outside the, the eatery and the brewery. And I just don't want it lost on them that what they're doing is important. And, and it is. People come in there. We've had six weddings in that facility since we've opened. We've had a multitude of other private events. And we've held politicians there to run for office. And we've plated 250 meals for fundraisers. I mean, we, 
really enjoy the fact that we can do that. Although in the, you know, when you're in the weeds, you're going like, why the hell did I do this? <laughs> you know, you, know yep. you look, you look in the mirror and go, there's a guy whose ass I want to kick over this, you know, but seriously, at the end of the day, when everything's calmed down and you can turn the ovens off and clean up and walk out, I want everybody to feel very rewarded about what they did and want them to know we appreciate it because these are how things grow and these are how things multiply. And this is of service to a community that badly needed it. Yep. That's one of the main reasons, too, we opened it. We never really could find quite what we wanted in the area like we used to in Fort Worth and Dallas. So we said, hey, let's just create it. And it's been a success. That's really cool. And I think it's it's absolutely the case. And I think you're right. I mean, so many people in the hospitality industry, they do it because they love to. They do it almost because they need to. And it really is something that if you can take a step back and look at life and look at what really matters and not get caught up in a lot of what's going on around us, because most of the exogenous stimuli that we're exposed to that we don't actually curate and select, but that we just happen to find TV, magazine, social media, it's all there to manipulate us into behaving a certain way or buying a certain product. You know, it's most of it isn't there to really nurture us and to really support those things that matter. I'm talking about the stuff that's not curated. There's a lot of phenomenal content on social media and elsewhere that can enrich your life. But yeah. in the big scheme of things, hosting a wedding, creating an evening where old friends can get together and have lasting memories, serving the community. I mean, these things are, are so important. And I think we lose sight of them because we don't understand how valuable they are. And, and we should, you know? Yeah, I agree. And the other thing I was thinking about as I was listening to you, and I have to sort of um, catch myself, is that when you're pursuing your interests and you're pursuing something that is important to you, it's never self-indulgent. Like one of the traps that I've fallen into in the past, Jeff, a little bit, and that I have to catch myself, is I, I almost buy into this thing that I've got to be hyper-focused on what I'm doing and grind like crazy and block out all distractions. And there are times when yeah. it's appropriate to do that. And there are times when I've had to do it and you definitely get results and it's great. But I also think that there are times where if you stay in that mindset, you lose something too. I agree. You know, if I was always in that mindset, I wouldn't have had the reference points, the knowledge that I needed either to, to deal with adversity or to really appreciate something joyous. You know what I mean? Oh, I completely agree. And I, I think that was one of my hardest things. I think in any aspect where I've been connected to the restaurant business is I've tended to hold on too tightly. And I have had to do the same thing and catch myself and say, okay, one, it's okay to delegate. And that, you know, if, if shown properly, that delegation can happen really well. But I, I hear you. I think it's very human to get wrapped up uh, so tightly in something that that, that hyper focus certainly creates issues for you it has for me and so being able to kind of step back and and do a bit more hovering around thirty thousand feet versus being right down there in the fray makes a huge difference and it lets you get a different perspective too and i, I just mentioned that because it's been difficult for me to, to step away i just feel like at times no i've absolutely got to do this and then that that robs another individual of having an experience and learning you know how to do it properly in my humble opinion. No, I agree with you. I'm a, I'm a huge believer in delegating, and I'm also really very much a believer in, you know, if you're blessed to have great managers or great people on your team, one of the challenges that I try to, to address successfully is I want to create an environment here at Woolco. Because what I've found is the great managers that I have, the great people here that work here, are people that love taking personal responsibility for their work. They want the work that they're doing to be a reflection of them and their abilities. And so the challenge is to get people to be as creative as they can be in their eyes, not my eyes. And I know, you know, we're talking about work. People think, well, where's the creativity? There's always creativity when you're dealing with people. There's always creativity when there's problem solving. So I think delegation is a huge thing. I think cultivating that trust with people and giving them the space because ultimately 
I don't want to have a business where every single person is relying on me to tell them every single thing to do. I'm going to go nowhere but down in that environment, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But it's really cool. The story is so fascinating. Do you find a lot of people driving from Abilene or, or, or other metropolitan areas of Texas? Oh, oh, most definitely. Yeah, we've got several things kind of going on in that question there. It, one, we have a lot of people that travel from Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth, San Angelo, Abilene. Within a 150-mile radius, there's 10.9 million people. Within a hundred mile radius, we hit around 3.5 million. So that'll give you a distance of just what 50 more miles can bring, like Fort Worth or, or Austin, or San Antonio. But we do get a lot of that because people do travel through a main artery here heading west, but also because there is some solid commerce here. And frankly, uh, post pandemic, there has been such a, a surge of relocation throughout not only Texas and its cities, but, you know, we, we are getting people from New York, New Jersey, California, Arizona, who are transplanting to Texas for a variety of reasons. And so it's neat to have a thumb on the pulse of that change. And, and we know it because we talk to our patrons. Where are you from? What are you doing here? Are you relocated permanently or temporarily? And you know, we get a lot of medical industry that comes through the area. And so being so remote in many respects, being central in Texas, you still have enough lifelines and tentacles reaching out to large areas that both come for both recreation and, and whether it be hunting or, or whether it be just getting back out to rural areas and experiencing that via state parks or, or state lakes, things of that nature. But we have seen a huge surge of people coming in who've relocated and now working remotely on a permanent basis, both right in Brownwood and on the you know, uh, the outskirts of Brownwood and other small towns with much smaller populace than, than what Brownwood has. Mm. You know, you've got a lot of oil industry here, obviously, uh, but we also have Kohler and 3M as, as a couple of major commerce pockets here and, and several other manufacturing components that exist in this uh, this little community. So it, it, it's interesting to, to see and hear and feel it. And even the realtors who we've become very friendly with, you know, they've run out of inventory almost per company that exists here. And we have a lot of realtors here. So we, we talk with them quite a bit. And I mean, they're literally grasping for inventory right now. There's a lot of those pocket contracts that exist versus going to their file cabinet and trying to pull out something that would fit somebody's request I bet. for a purchase. You know, I was and I was going to talk to you about that off air because listening to what you're describing, I would love to have a, a place in that type of setting. My parents were divorced when I was five, and my dad was from upstate New York. So I was very familiar. I mean, I'm a city kid. I grew up in New York City, but I spent a lot of time upstate New York. And I think you're absolutely right. I'm even seeing it. I'm, I'm in New Jersey. I was born and raised in New York City. I live in New Jersey and, and in the suburbs now. So this isn't even the country. But you do see a lot of people moving around. And I also do see a lot of restaurants that are taking on different types of cuisine or just different concepts that you would not normally see. But you, but but then you understand that the people who are moving in are driving that type of demand for that type of establishment, and you can see it changing. And that's that's really cool, man. I I'm happy that that's happening. You know, I could sit and I could sit and talk to you all day, but I don't want to take up your time. So I want to end it with with one question. Well, two questions. One is just for me, which will be very quick. The other is for our audience, uh, restaurateurs and entrepreneurs, and and all of that. As you, you, you'd you said you're you're working on the hotel, you're, you, know, you have Teddy's Brew House. When you decide to take on a project such as you've done, it all seems to happen organically for you. Yet as I'm listening to you, you clearly are a very good business person. You're talking about that you're strategically located on the trail, the way you design your menu, how you get stuff out. So my question is, for people that are looking to just get started, people who dream of opening their own restaurant or, or their own bar or something, but they want to do something, I'm going to use the word exotic because I think it is, or something really cool, which is tie it into refurbishing a building. What would be the one bit of advice yep. you'd want to give somebody just starting out on their own business venture? What do you think is the most, not the most important, but something you'd want to share with them that they know right at the beginning of their journey? Well, I, I, I tend to self-deprecate, <laughs> you know, when it comes to 
your question here. And, and what I mean by that is I make it sound as though I probably don't do my research or it seems organic. And there are times that it is absolutely 100% organic. But I've been talking to this hotel owner for the last four years. So obviously it's not organic. And when we looked at being on the whiskey beer trail, that was something that we researched before deciding to open, not necessarily knowing it, but when we did know it, okay, hey, it makes sense to do this. So I do tend to do quite a bit of research uh, versus just like shooting from the hip. That said, more specific to your, your question, you know, I think what I tend to do is I'll say, okay, we're going to take this building and do a historic renovation. Well, that requires that you really are going to wait on your money for performance tax credit sell back, for example, or the federal income tax incentives that come with that, which are fantastic because they help offset a great deal of cost. But I certainly did do a lot of research to make sure that that was the type of gamble I wanted to take. And did I want to have someone watching over my shoulder so diligently, you know, with the U.S. government and the state government on how that renovation is done? Because they certainly have a say in its completion. So I tend to look at any project from, from a multitude of different directions before ready, aim, fire. I definitely get that about you, which was what was so cool. On the one hand, like I said, somebody looking at it from the outside, like, wow, this is so cool, a refurbished gun store in Theodore Roosevelt. Yeah. But what I guess what I'm hearing in your answer is you have to really be strategic at the beginning or at least make this. Yeah, you've got to have a plan. You've got to have a plan. And if you don't have a plan, you're in trouble. And then how are you going to execute that plan to the best of your ability, but also as you mentioned, what is going to be most strategic. So I, I tend to line item things out from a standpoint of importance. And I know that seems oversimplified, but there's a lot that goes into making sure that that really is the correct approach. Let me tell you one fault that I have in, in our planning. I should have bought a lot more property before really announcing future intent. And I didn't do that. And it's cost me. <laughs> yep. You know, I, I wish I'd have been a bit more quiet, but I was so excited. I let my passion kind of sneak out. But I, I would tell people that obviously you've got to want to have a passion about what you're doing and find the best MO for that development. And, and I'm also in a unique position, too, because I think a lot of people look at it like, you know, I've got to have a huge capital reserve component to do what he's doing. Well, I've had several careers, so I had several pensions. I don't have to use this as my day job. And that makes it way different than somebody who's coming in and they've got to make ends meet from day one as they roll out and open. And if they don't have capital reserves, it makes it even more difficult. So one of the reasons that I can be, I think, so successful right now is because I'm willing to put in that time without worrying about large returns right now. But that allows me to go for the long game here. You know, that's my ultimate goal is to try to look at something five years down the road and where it'll eventually be. The hotel is going to take a year to a year and a half worth of study and then two, two and a half years worth of construction once we pull the trigger. But that's a $38 million venture that has a massive return on tax credits and income tax credits and investors are already knocking on the door, which is really encouraging. And, and we've seen it done several times in Texas in like buildings. And so you know, I see a plan here. The only difference between it and Teddy's is it's a decimal, yep. you know, and, and where does that decimal apply? But to most people, they would be absolutely petrified and, and scared away from something that would have such a high price point to refurbish. But when you look at it at the end of the day, when it's completed, we might be able to have this thing where a real out-of-pocket cost is somewhere between, say, 10 or $15 million, But now you've got a brand new luxury boutique hotel with a historic siding and National Park historic sighting that will draw traffic to the area and local businesses downtown, not to mention our, our, our Teddy's Brew House right across the street. So it's one of those things that I'm extremely excited about, but there's been a lot of planning and a lot of life experience that has had to happen before I got here. A lot of value in that. What I'm getting out of it is don't put yourself in a position where from day one, you know, you're sweating the return on the investment, allow time to be your friend, think big, think strategic from the beginning, have a big vision, just terrific, valuable answer. 
I've learned so much in this interview. I I appreciate one it. quick question, uh, and, and this is it. Yeah. If you were to recommend one book, history book, to people who are not historians or not academics, but would be of interest to them that are business people, and, and if, you, if that's too awkward of a question, I get it. But even for myself, just give me one book recommendation because I'm always interested in them. <laughs> well, it, man, it's hard to single it down for me for one book. But I, I will tell you what book I think has brought me probably more value in all of our ventures, both personal and private, and even in business. And, and I, honestly, it's The Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. I alluded to it earlier. There is so much to glean from that book and those quotes that are so applicable to today's day. It, it's just, it also, to me, is just an astonishing read. Certainly a man who poured a great deal of passion and, and education into his verbiage on the page. And I've gotten so much from it, even in dealing with people in the hospitality business. Or you know as well as I do that you know when you're in this type of business, self-doubt can creep in rather easily on a bad night i i think man i probably lean on that more than anything uh, more than anything i i've got personal things that i like in literature that are of value no, that's a great too, one but i think that's an awesome applicable book and especially in today's climate it's nice to be reminded of those quotes and meditations as he put them because they are gosh man they, they sure do help to to have a stoic approach is important, I think. I completely agree with you. I'm familiar with that book, and I, it's super powerful. So for those listening, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius and The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt by Edmund Morris. Jeff, this has been such a pleasure for me. I've gotten so much out of it, and I really appreciate you making the time so quickly so that we could put this together and I am very much looking forward to going to Teddy's and taking my family to Texas because I've always wanted, I've been to Texas before, but never the part where you are. And it looks so cool. And anyway, man, this was just really terrific. So for anybody that wants to follow Jeff, go to Instagram. You can go to Teddy's Brew House, and that is spelled T-E-D-D-Y-S-B-R-E-W-H-A-U-S. I also like your Instagram account. Is that just Jeff Tucker at IG? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You've got a very cool Instagram account and um, so much value here. So, Jeff, I really appreciate this, man, and I want to thank you again and uh, really, really enjoyed this. Well, it's really been my pleasure, and I'm glad to be of service. I appreciate it, man. Thank you, Jeff. Have a great day. You too. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Profitable Table, fed by Woolco Foods. Please be sure to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. And to learn more about Woolco Foods or Stephen Toberoff, please visit us at woolcofoods.net.